Killings captured on tape, videos that go viral, and justice denied in Palestine. An exiled Russian news channel encounters problems in its new home in Latvia. And double standards that echo of Orientalism, the news coverage of the World Cup in Qatar. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and analyze how news gets reported. We begin with an Israeli border policeman and the execution of a young Palestinian in broad daylight. That killing caught on camera makes for disturbing viewing, but it is the type of violence that constantly comes with life under occupation. The Israeli military has killed more Palestinians on the West Bank this year than in any year since 2004. Also caught in the crosshairs, Palestinian journalists. They say Israel is waging a war on them. The army and police operating in the occupied territories do so with impunity. But because of the availability of video footage, their abuses no longer go unseen. Evidence of their crimes frequently ends up online, making a far greater impact abroad than it does within the Israeli media. The disconnect between how Israel views itself and how the rest of the world sees it has been on display in Qatar at the World Cup. Israeli journalists there have been getting an earful from fans who want to talk about more than just football. Our starting point this week is the occupied West Bank. This is a story of an occupation in which the horrifying has become routine, the new normal in an apartheid state. Ra'ed al nassam was 21, one of five Palestinians killed by Israeli forces in four different places on the West Bank on the same day. The soldiers claimed they shot him when he was throwing a Molotov cocktail their way. The video, acquired by the BBC, proves otherwise. 72 hours later, another video appears online. The point-blank Israeli execution of a 23-year-old, Amar Mufle. What you see is an Israeli soldier at the behest of an Israeli settler try to arrest a Palestinian for a simple traffic accident. And the soldier resorts to violence by shooting this man four times. Now the part that you don't see in the video is the army then refused to allow medical treatment um, and then also ended up stealing his body and has yet to be returned to the family. What was shocking about it is not that it happens because it happens every single day. It's that this time it was recorded and sent around the world. As soon as the video came out, the um, Israeli authorities released a statement that the young Palestinian man had been involved in a stabbing previously, allegedly, and at least as far as Israeli, Israeli media was concerned, that was the end of the story. He was a presumed terror suspect and the use of lethal force was justified, even though the video did not show any um, threat to the soldier's life and the soldier received support from essentially all echelons of the Israeli state from uh, the high-ranking high military officers and even um, the sort of outgoing lame duck Prime Minister Yair Lapid. Israel's incoming government, elected six weeks ago, is shaping up as the most extreme in its history. Led by the returning Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who still faces corruption charges for manipulating Israeli media coverage the last time he was in the job, the coalition includes an ultra-right-wing element in the form of Itamar Ben Gavir and his Jewish power party. Ben Gavir, who was among the first to congratulate the soldier who killed Amar Muflis, is expected to be put in charge of national security. 2022 has been a deadly year in the occupied territories. Military and police forces have killed at least 138 Palestinians on the West Bank alone, the most since 2004. Reporters trying to get that story out to the world have had it bad. The Palestinian Journalists Syndicate recently told UN investigators that Israel is waging a wide-scale war on media workers. 
The new Israeli government coalition is a frightening prospect for Palestinians. Whilst it is simply a changing of the prison guards, because ultimately there is no room for Palestinian rights. The Israeli regime has systematically targeted Palestinian journalists and the Palestinian media, whether it's been through uh, physical assaults, detaining Palestinians, arresting uh, Palestinian journalists, because the Israeli regime does not want Palestinian journalists to show the world what is really happening. This is happening under the outgoing government that people hold up as being more moderate, more liberal, more responsible. They have not rushed to condemn, to investigate, to hold accountable. I mean, this is kill, exonerate, repeat. And the uptick in Israeli military operations preceded the election. It was part of the campaign that the outgoing Prime Minister Lapid ran in the election. When Israeli forces kill Palestinians, the official defense offered usually starts with a denial, then a deflection of the allegation. Justice is typically delayed. It's almost always denied. The murder seven months ago of Al Jazeera correspondent Shireen Abu Akleh is an infamous case in point. The Israeli military's deceptions, first that it was a Palestinian bullet, then that Abu Akleh was just caught in the crossfire when there was none, have been exposed by multiple investigations, some journalistic, some NGO-driven, real scrutiny, as opposed to men in uniform just going through the motions. The video evidence now available, combined with satellite imagery, has been a game changer. Al Jazeera and the Abu Akleh family have taken that material to the International Criminal Court at The Hague, which is now deciding whether it will hear the case against Israel. I don't think anyone will be held accountable, but it shows that the Israeli regime not only lied and attempted to mislead the public about what happened, it then backtracked and finally settled on a narrative that this was a regrettable mistake. It shows that the Israeli regime doesn't actually care if people know that it kills Palestinians. What's amazing is that there were so many investigations into Shireen's assassination from NGOs, Bellingcat, uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, CNN, the Associated Press, and the New York Times. Probably the most investigated assassination that we've seen, and yet not a single Israeli journalist did any investigation into Shireen's assassination. Most Israeli reporters and the news outlets they work for offer quality, critical journalism on the country's domestic politics, the never-ending elections. But when it comes to coverage of the occupation, they tend to toe the official red line. And there's an emphasis on how the United Arab Emirates and a few other Arab states are normalizing relations with Israel. When Israeli reporters travel to cover stories like the World Cup in Qatar, they get a taste of how the outside world really sees their country and its treatment of Palestinians. You are not welcome here. There is only Palestine. They see firsthand the evidence of the disconnect between certain Arab leaders and their citizens. For Israelis had grown accustomed because of the normalization agreements to thinking that Palestinians had been forgotten, that the people had stopped paying attention. And Israeli journalists have reacted kind of with incomprehension that they have been faced such hostility. Uh, channel is this? Israel channel. You don't like us? Which attests to the reality uh, that most Israelis are insulated both from the realities of the occupation and also from um, criticism of the occupation elsewhere, elsewhere in the world. What's been really interesting at this World Cup is that it's been the first opportunity to conduct a mass public opinion poll on the premise of normalization in terms of the marginalization of Palestine as an issue that resonates with broad swathes of Arab public opinion. I also think in the global south, well beyond 
uh, Arab states. And the verdict is unequivocal, which is that regimes, authoritarian regimes, may be able to say, forget the Palestinian issue, we're going to normalize. The publics are not buying it. I think they were expecting a very warm welcome. And instead they realize that for as much as they may have military power, as much as they have, may have political power, as much as they may have diplomatic power, we're the ones who have the power of the people and the power of love. There's been a surprising twist in the tale of the exiled Russian broadcaster TV Rain, Having fled Moscow soon after the invasion of Ukraine, setting up shop in Latvia, the channel now finds itself in broadcast limbo. Minakshi Ravi has the details. Richard, we've reported on TV Rain, which is called Dodged in Russian, and the turbulent times it's gone through for being critical of the Putin government since the invasion. Back in February, most of Dodged's newsroom escaped Russia and regrouped in the Latvian capital, Riga. They started broadcasting from there just five months ago. Latvian regulators have now revoked its TV license. Сегодня утром, рано утром, Национальный совет по электронной медиа Латвии принял решение об отзыве лицензии у телеканала Дождь. The Latvian authorities accused Dodged of taking a pro-Russian line based on two examples from its broadcasts. One was a map showing Crimea as part of Russia, which it de facto has been ever since Russia took control of the region in 2014. The other was when an anchor, reporting on the mobilization of more troops in Russia, threw in a message of solidarity with Russian soldiers. The anchor has been fired and Dodge's editor-in-chief says the channel has never provided support to the Russian army, nor are its journalists backing the Kremlin's war efforts covertly. Latvia's security service has opened an investigation into Dojd, looking for connections the outlet's journalists may have with Russian intelligence. So to summarize, a Russian news channel forced out of the country for questioning the war on Ukraine is now off the air in another country, a NATO country no less, for allegedly being pro-war. Dojd says it will continue its work on YouTube, where it gets most of its viewers anyway. Thanks, Mina. Just one more week until the final match of the 2022 World Cup. We've seen some spectacular matches, some unexpected results. However, ever since Qatar won its bid to host this tournament 12 years ago, football journalists, usually just concerned with events on the pitch, have spent considerable time reporting on issues off it. Questions about Qatar, its suitability as a host nation. That has provoked a response from many in the global south and the Arab world, including officials in Doha itself. They are arguing that Qatar is the target of an unprecedented media campaign that has some racist, orientalist undertones. Mega events like the World Cup offer nations the opportunity to present themselves on the global stage. However, with all the negative press, has the multi-billion dollar investment that Qatar has made paid off? The Listening Post's Johanna Husnow from Doha. The 2022 World Cup here in Qatar has been one of many firsts. The first in the Middle East. The first in December. The first to allow fans to attend multiple games in a day. However, the tournament has been unprecedented in another way as well. Ever since it was awarded to Qatar in 2010, it's been the first mega sporting event to elicit media coverage that has been as much about politics as it has been about the games. Most of the global reaction really focused less on the selling point of this being a World Cup for the region and a moment of arrival and emergence for, for Qatar specifically, and seeing it much more as a way to scrutinize many of the internal practices and policies governing everything from migrant labor to many cultural issues. Um, in the kind of so-called clash of values between kind of Western countries that have been very protective over global football in the World Cup in particular as kind of their own right, their own domain. We all know that mega sporting events or any of these kinds of global events that draw the entire world's attention have both positive and negatives. The positive, of course, is to gain recognition, to perhaps gain, get on people's radar. But it's also the time where, you know, you're, everything is on view. You're seeing what's and all. And so Qatar has had, had 12 years of that. 
12 years of negative headlines questioning Qatar's suitability as a host of this World Cup, be it for allegations of corruption in the bidding process or over matters relating to the treatment of migrant workers and LGBT issues. Sam Cunningham is one of thousands of journalists who travel to Doha to cover this tournament. Now, you are out here to cover the football, but this tournament has obviously been about so much more than that. How challenging has it been as a sports journalist to navigate the politics whilst trying to cover the game? The role of a sports journalist has definitely changed. Just because sport, uh, and football in particular, has got so big in the world, it's completely caught up in global politics and um, domestic politics. I definitely think a lot of sports journalists now they will see that if, they, if there are off-field issues that are, that are rising, um, that it's their duty to, to report on them. Doha has responded to the critiques with some labour policy changes and before the World Cup started announced that, quote, everyone was welcome. I believe a lot of the criticism is unjust. Qatari officials have also taken issue with the relentlessness of the coverage, pointing out, not entirely without justification, that some of it was sensationalist, reductive, at times even orientalist. When we look at Western media coverage of Qatar, it runs from the hysterical in the British tabloids to the serious in, say, the New York Times. And indeed, uh, there are stories that have gotten a lot of traction that have just been lazy reporting by people who aren't actually in Qatar. If I wanted to single out one example above all, it would be the February 2021 article that The Guardian published saying that 6,500 workers have been killed in Qatar since the bid was won in 2010 and suggesting that these were all tied to stadium construction. In fact, uh, the deaths tied to stadium construction were about 1% of that number. And also what they missed is the obvious, which is that in a population of 1.4 million immigrants over 12 years, 6,500 deaths is actually low. And it's about the same for a country like Germany or the UK. Nonetheless, that number, that 6,500 number, gets repeated all the time. The things that I have found most problematic is that there has been a continuous focusing on a background narrative about this region, Qatar, as this exceptional Arab country, which has its own peculiar, somewhat mysterious, uh, you know, and socially and culturally distinct forms of dealing with workers, as opposed to the fact that it replicates many other temporary labor migration regimes in other global contexts. This is not to say that, oh, it's happening elsewhere, so it's okay that it happens in Qatar. Not at all. Temporary labor migrants are exploited, exploitable, and vulnerable in whichever context they work in, right? But there has been a civilizational tone in some of how these stories have you know, been developed. I definitely disagree agree with that. For a start, we're not saying there's not issues back home. In fact, there's plenty of issues back home. And th these are raised all the time. So I, I, de I definitely disagree that there's any kind of like element of we're just, you know, Western journalists are coming over here and just finding trouble and issues where there aren't. These, these are legitimate issues. It's only right that people report on them. I guess part of the criticism, though, is that we've had, you know, tournaments hosted by Russia, Olympic Games in China. Why haven't we seen this kind of rigorous coverage of some of these issues before, be it in Russia, be it in China, etc.? I definitely think there has been an acceptance that Russia wasn't reported on um, as thoroughly as it should have been. And, and I hold my hands up to that myself. I was out there covering it and, you know, with more writing about this is a how great the tournament was and then a couple of years later Vladimir Putin started a war in Europe so we kind of saw how you know what what happened after what is essentially a, a big PR exercise for for for, for Russia. And you still have um, a kind of a mainstream sort of media machine um, that has kind of treated this this situation quite exceptionally and in ways that we won't necessarily unfortunately see in the coverage of future tournaments or in the coverage of past tournaments and that includes countries like Russia and China but also like the US and the UK in terms of you know the legacy of the invasion of, of Iraq and Afghanistan so there are clearly blind spots that I think exist um, within many segments of the media unfortunately and again just to, to make this absolutely clear 
the point here isn't to say that because those things are not talked about, then Qatar should be given a free pass. I actually would say the opposite, that let's apply these things everywhere, including to Qatar as well. A competition that began in a blaze of hypocritical sanctimony has become what it always should have been, a feast of great football. The inconsistency in reporting has led to some in the Western media to call out their own. Qatar is also a significant investor in many aspects of UK life. For example, it gives us 25% of our gas. Would all the virtue signalers back home prefer we tell Qatar to stop sending us gas? Amidst all of the news media reporting on this World Cup, there have been journalists working with this news network, Al Jazeera, headquartered here in Qatar. For media observers, Al Jazeera and its output through the tournament has been worth a close watch. There's been so much analysis as to why Qatar established Al Jazeera in the first place. What, and I think, you know, some of those suggest that the main motivation is playing a more regional role, international role, gaining recognition for fields beyond hydrocarbons, beyond gas. And then, of course, the challenge, because once you, know, you, you produce something like a global media enterprise on your territory, you, know, you, you look into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. So no media organization based in Qatar could be completely legitimate if it didn't also focus attention on the domestic sphere. This news network basically meant to undercut the kind of hegemonic narrative coming from state medias everywhere and instead for the first time offering a perspective that is much more representative of the kind of the everyday experience of uh, Arab populations throughout this region. So fast forwarding now to the question of how you know it's played a role in the World Cup. I mean I think you know Part of it, of course, is trying to respond to many of these pressures that Qatar has come under. Nasser, what's your message for the fans who are still debating whether they'll, they're coming to the country or not? My message to the fans is um, you are welcome here. I think the coverage within the network has tried to kind of toe a very delicate line. I think there, there have been kind of some sensitivities in part because I think you know, the state has taken a very defensive posture given the kinds of attacks that it's been under um, and not wanting to see its own network contributing to that. And so I think, you know, there have been openings or opportunities to explore some of these issues in more nuance, perhaps. International sporting events have always been an opportunity for nation branding. Qatar is trying hard to shape how it will be remembered once the games come to an end on December 18th. Western media certainly haven't helped Qatar's case. Whether they will stay on this story once the final whistle blows remains to be seen. Scholars who study this stuff know that with sport and mega events, there is a long period before the tournament starts, which is incessantly negative. Then after the tournament is over, everybody goes home and we forget the whole thing. So the other question is, will this discussion about human rights and sports continue or simply be forgotten until the next sport mega event? And finally, back to Russia, where a new propaganda video has been making the rounds online, mocking men who are leaving the country because of the mobilization of more soldiers to send to Ukraine. New conscripts and their relatives have been complaining about the lack of payments and training the authorities are rather sensitive about that, so they've banned public discussions on the mobilization and the growth of the Russian military. Censoring that kind of talk paves the way for propaganda like the following video. It tells Russians that the boys have left, but the men have stayed, ready to serve. We'll see you next time, here at the Listening Post. <laughs> Мужик крутой, в банке работает. Уезжаете куда? В Грузию, ну совсем. Вот и этот побежал. У нас на работе тоже несколько мальчиков уехало. Ой! Да, мальчики уехали, мужчины остались. Ой, ой.